Okay, Itamex Kanatani, good morning. It is maybe closing in on 8 o'clock in the a.m. on Friday, September 6th, 2019, in the lunar cycle Bakipis Tsotsitetspi when the choke cherries ripen. Just getting my day started, just uh, leaving the house and gonna climb in Dave's truck and go fetch a couple of animals. Figured I'd bring my video along with me and take you guys along for the adventure. Good morning. I think it's a skunk. Yeah? Where, where are you? Where is he at? Right there. Oh, just in here. <laughs> nice old old fashioned wood box trap. Oh, yeah, we got somebody. Yeah. Yeah, you got a skunky. Skunk? Yeah. Who is it? Skunky. Mr. Skunk. It's a nice heavy duty trap this guy made. Really pretty well built. I wouldn't mind having some of these traps for the skunkies. Come on out. Big butt. <laughs> Like that's a big skunky. No back door on this one. That's kind of unfortunate because sometimes it's hard to get him to come out just one side. There he goes. Got a skunk. See ya. All right, we got another one to go fetch now. Next skunky. It's the empty trap. This must be the trap with the skunk. Oh yes, let's say so. Hey buddy, ready to go for a ride? Hey there, skunky. Go on. Go for a run. Look, Scott, you're free. You're free to go. See ya. Yeah, see you later. There you go. You're a big one. Yes, you are. Yeah, I don't want to be sprayed by you. Go ahead. <laughs> my wildlife work for the morning. Let's get on with other things. Have you guys seen these new remote control lawnmowers? It's pretty cool. It looks like Lethbridge Parks has bought at least one. I don't know. I've seen I've seen uh, them using one. Uh, I'm, I just passed them using one as I was driving down uh, Métis Trail, so I'll go show you. But yeah, if you live in Lethbridge, keep an eye out for these. And then if, uh, if you don't, you know, knock on your own hometown's uh, parks department and say, look at this stuff. <laughs> because I can see this as being a useful way of, um, you know, having a one-man lawn mowing operation um, in sensitive areas with animals and having that one man down on the ground to scout out for them. I don't know if that's what our parks had in mind when they bought these things or what, but, um, but I can definitely see that. Being, being useful. It's way better than a guy, you know, up on the lawnmower just speeding along, you know, riding on it when it's got extensions sticking out, you know, 10, 12 feet on either side. Can't see what he's going to mow over. But I think with this RC unit, there's possibilities. Check it out. So here's the unit. Turns out I came upon them just as he's gotten it's stuck high centered and kind of dug in so it has this little winch on it that's used to make sure it doesn't tip on steep slopes and so they're going to try to pull it out now this is only the second time I guess in two years that 
it's gotten stuck. After talking with the operator, I'm kind of thinking I might be wrong about the uses of this for the wildlife work because uh, he's telling me he can see a lot better when he's up on a track on a, on a you know regular ri riding mower unit than he can when he's operating this one because he can't be in front of the thing and he can't see over it so he says he hits rocks and stuff pretty often. I think it'll give him a hand. Yeah, it's pretty well stuck here. Even with us trying to lift it, the two of us, and I guess it's only about 300 pounds, but I don't know. We're not able to, weren't able to get it unstuck even with her pulling with the truck. So she's gonna situate the truck higher and try a little bit of lift with it. I'm worried about that little tow line snapping, actually. <laughs> oh, oh, here we go. Yeah, so I think that mower has its pros and its cons, eh? I mean, like the operator was saying, he's got to stay back. Well, he's supposed to stay back at least 10 feet from the thing, and he can't walk in front of it. And so he does hit obstacles. He hits rocks and things that he can't see coming up. <clears throat> but after I was kind of looking at it a little bit more and, and stuff, um, I started thinking, well... How fast do you move with this mower compared to how fast you move with the riding mowers, right? The riding mowers, these guys truck along pretty quick at a pretty, pretty quick pace with them. And it's a wide swath, you know, and usually on both sides of the, of the mower. Um, and so they're moving across rapidly and hitting a lot of area. With this little thing, you're not moving as fast and the area is tight, hey, it's controlled. I think um, even though the operator might not have as much opportunity to see the animals come in as he would on top of a, a mower, or at least he doesn't have the, the view perspective, right? He's hitting rocks. Um, animals aren't rocks. And so I think with a guy on the, on the ground and this unit moving along um, at a slower pace and, and covering less area at one time I think the animals have a better shot of moving out of the way themselves you know seeing this coming and moving out of the way themselves before it gets there so I think it has its pros its cons I think it uh something that might be worth experimenting with in the parks you know do do a year or two of the mows in the parks with that unit and then um and then see if any animals are hit you know uh, obviously like ground nesting birds would have an issue i mean the moms will moms will be able to to fly out out of way but as long as the operator's there on the ground he's going to see that stuff too so he has a better chance i think probably of avoiding ground nests um just by paying attention to whether or not he spooks you know any mama birds up so i don't know i think uh i think it's worth playing with worth considering as a as an option for decreasing animal mortality especially reptile mortality <laughs> in our parks oh anyway procrastinating enough this morning I need, I need to get to the office okay so here i am in my modest little cubicle office my windowless haunt <laughs> I can't complain about this at all. Um, in fact, I'm a little bit worried that this is going to go away. Our launch date for this program, for the Aboriginal Arts and Entrepreneurship Program, is coming right up. 
um, September 16th. It's actually supposed to run. Today was to be the deadline for applications. And out of 12 people that we have to have to start the program, we have nine applications, one of which has some serious issues, um, a good number of which are solid applications, but you know, there's a few that are a little bit iffy. Like really what we should have is 30 to 40 applications like normal and we're looking through them and we're finding the, the best applicants to fit this particular program. But the recruitment period has been so short and during that period we had things like the Sundance and Whoop Up Days and Blood Tribe distribution and people weren't just coming around to the to the job center. So we've got a problem. Um, today was the deadline, we don't have enough applications. So there was a meeting between the director of SAMIS, this organization I'm working for, um, and the funders. And it was requested that by the, by the SAMIS director that we have an extension on the start date and that we start on October 1st instead of, instead of September 16th. That would give us another two weeks to be recruiting. Um, but the funders, the government, Service Canada says no. <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. Um, you guys, your start date is September 16th, and you need to start that day. You need to have at least 10 applicants um, by this next coming Thursday, you know, the Thursday before the Monday start date. You need to have 10 applicants that are, that are in. And then if we have those 10, we can start on that Monday, and they would allow us a grace of one week basically till September 20th to recruit in the other two that we would need to have our minimal 12 students. And if we don't get there, then we don't have a program. They're gonna fold it. That's pretty scary, because there's a lot of people right now, well, not a lot, but there's a good, you know, maybe myself and several instructors and, you know, um, and, the, and the clients who are signed up who are expecting this to happen and, uh, and counting on it <laughs> for our winter plan. Plans might fall through, I don't know. Um, this is just another challenge like any of the challenges that I've you know, been facing in my life where even though I, I am gonna like, I just been hammering our way at the, at the kind of student handbook this afternoon doing paperwork but receiving this news and having a little bit of stress and then um, being the hour that it is, I've got maybe a half hour before the regular Samus office closes. So I'd like to get over there quick and have them print me up some more posters because all of our posters around town have the deadline on them. So we need some new posters with a different date or no date and get, get those circulating out there. Um, you know, basically this challenge just, I, I'm looking at it with the mountain climbing mentality. <laughs> that being, you know, those lessons that I've learned up on the mountains where you can see something, um, an obstacle, even the mountain itself, like the mountain itself, it's giant and intimidating and stuff. And you don't really know what that mountain actually looks like from a close range until you're right up on it. Um, but even then, sometimes it can, it can be intimidating to people. You know, there's, there's certain as parts of, you know, trails and stuff that you're going through and you, you might see this area and it just like, might look completely impassable. But if you just go ahead and move through it and start moving through it, sometimes it opens up to you, you know, while you're in the middle of the passage, you don't see it necessarily from the outside. You have to get yourself going in there and then, and then things reveal, reveal, you know, the way, the path. So I'm hoping that's what this is going to be, you know, like just keep moving ahead. And, uh, if you build it, they will come kind of mentality <laughs> with the mountain climbing thing. Um, and you know, just the knowledge that the buffaloes face the storm, you know, buffaloes face the storm and that's the quickest way to pass through it. So. We'll see what we can do. Um, 
if you're in Lethbridge and you're First Nations or Aboriginal in general, even if you're Métis and you want to spend your winter um, training, learning a lot of different small business skills, um, hands-on in a, in a you know, retail establishment that you're helping to run and you want to learn Blackfoot arts, you know, if you're, if you're artisan, man, I would, I would have killed for uh, a program like this, you know, at certain times. Um, definitely if I didn't have a job, you know, that was paying more, I would, I would do this program. So I don't know where everybody is. I think it's just the timing and all of that. Like the end of August, it was powwows and whoop up days and the Sundance and the Blood Tribe's big distribution. Not the right time to be expecting people to walk in the door to the employment agency. But <laughs> now we've got to really hustle um, and pull a few people together. And if not, I'll deal with that when it comes because that's a possibility too. You know, it's a possibility my winter work could come to an abrupt halt in about a week's time. <laughs> But let's hope it doesn't come to that because I really don't need any more challenges, you know. Anyway, I'm going to shut down shop here, swing over to Samus, get some of those other posters, um, maybe start hanging them around town. I've got a couple of skunk traps to set. And then I'm either going to go home or and work on some, I've been building some bunk beds and I've, I've got a cart, uh, a whiteboard cart, a rolly whiteboard cart that I want to build for here. I might go do some of that work or I might go to the park. I don't know yet. My brain's still like just just spinning after being told. Because I thought for sure the government would be like, okay, you know, go ahead and run it October 1st. That makes sense. They've got a lot of money invested, you know. But um, it's not the way it's going. I don't know why. Maybe, Maybe they have some kind of deadlines that they have to meet. This program ends mid-March. Maybe they're concerned they're not going to get their reporting done um, by the end of the first quarter if they let us extend. Makes sense, something like that. But all the same, and, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know why any anybody would be willing to risk, you know, putting some money toward a project very, you know, like, um, different kind of project like this is. Why, why set that money there and say that's where we're going to invest it and then be willing to rescind it just because we haven't had the opportunity, I think, to recruit the people that we need to recruit. They're here. They're here. We just got to we just got to be able to find them. So I don't know. It's going to be a high stress week. Um, I don't have time to work on it tomorrow. I've got a videographer coming. He's doing a film on rattlesnakes, prairie rattlesnakes. Um, for the Smithsonian. Well, Prairie Rattlesnakes is going to feature. I don't know if that's the whole film, but I don't think so. But uh, he's hiring me as his guide for the day, so I'm going to be busy with that, going out to the Box Canyon and such. Um, so I won't be able to get back to this project until Sunday. <laughs> and the days are ticking. It's scary stuff, but I can't let myself get overwhelmed. I got too much, too much of that in my life. You know, better get rolling. Challenges. Speaking of challenges, decided to come out here to the wilderness park near my place for my afternoon walkabout. And I've been coming here a lot more lately. Not as much Spobeek in me lately. Um... I think just because this is a novel place and I'm trying to get to know it. And tonight, as I'm out here, I find myself on the course of Lethbridge's Lost Soul Ultra, an ultra marathon that, you know, a really big ultra marathon that goes all the, through the Lethbridge coolies, up and down, up and down through the river valleys here. So as I'm talking, we'll probably see some of the ultra marathoners passing by <laughs> as I take my walk um but yeah I, I I did want to talk about challenges a little bit more because probably some of you are wondering for instance what's going on with the jeep 
where's my Jeep repair at? So here's the situation. Um, it's survivable, but it's not going to be cheap, you know. Um, there's significant mechanical problems, and it, there's like parts blown in the transmission that need to be replaced, and all the little pieces and stuff cleaned out, and the whole you know the whole thing needs to be worked. And then uh, here's somebody coming up behind me now, and um, and aside from that. Aside from uh, the transmission proper, the whole transfer case, I guess, needs to be swapped out, like completely new one put in, because it's just shot the heck. That's what was making the grinding noise, I guess. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it all has to be replaced. <laughs> uh, this is at National Transmission where I brought it, and Jared there, he popped off the um is it the the transfer pan or the transmission pan i don't know but some some kind of a pan where he showed me you know there were metal bits caught up on the magnet down there in the pan that's you know meant to catch uh debris stuff but yeah it had, it had caught some metal flakes down there and then um but the weird thing was there was no fluid in there like transmission oil or what have you um yeah there's nothing nothing in there to say and not only that but the the whole pan had never been taken off before um which is odd because last summer some of you will probably remember <laughs> i went through this same ordeal where the jeep broke down there was a transmission issue and um right around the time I just got my new rattlesnake transport case and so uh, I, I had to borrow Dave's truck and it was to the the repair was to the tune of a couple thousand bucks I had brought it to the Jeep shop the actual Jeep dealership um, thinking you know they're Jeep they're gonna do it right but apparently they hadn't even removed the pan <laughs> um, from the transfer case to even look, you know, or transmission or whatever it is that he said it would have been normal for them if they're doing transmission work, you're gonna take that pan off. The reason he knew that it had never been taken off was because it had its original seal on there. And he said, you know, once you separate that even once, you have to put a different kind of seal on there, a different uh, gasket. It doesn't have that fresh glued on seal, right? So he knows it's never been taken off, which means the Jeep guys fucked me last year. Because <laughs> um, why am I having my whole transmission and transfer case replaced again and, and stuff this year, right? So anyway, yeah, this year it's national transmission that I'm using. And from what he's shown me and what he's told me and the way that they've treated me, um, I think this is <laughs> a much higher recommended um establishment for getting some of this serious auto repair done uh but it's going to be expensive it's going to be two thousand dollars roughly for parts three thousand dollars roughly for labor so it's a five thousand dollar kind of repair and you have to seriously consider at that point and you know they told me well you know do you do you want to fix the jeep because it is more than 10 years old. It's a 2006. Um, it does have almost 300,000 kilometers on it. You know, is it worth it or should you trade it in by something new? Well, well, first of all, I'd never buy anything new. <laughs> um, I, I did buy a truck, one of my first vehicles that I actually paid out of, out of my pocket for. Well, not really, because it was a loan. <laughs> Um, I bought a Ford Ranger when I was in the military, fresh out of boot camp, uh, from a dealership in Texas, and it was almost brand new. It was like one year old, you know? Um, and I've, I quickly learned that I don't want to be making auto loan payments, you know? 
it's uh it makes life really tight financially i would rather spend however much money i need out of pocket to buy what i can afford to drive at the moment and so uh, you know and truth be told a lot of my vehicles in my life i've had assistance in buying um this cheap my mom loaned me, loaned me money you know i think it was maybe seven eight years ago she loaned me thirteen thousand to buy this jeep and i paid part of that back and then she kind of forgave the rest <laughs> um mahoney's dad gave us a ford f-150 once uh she and i bought a dodge shadow together just like it was only like a 35 four thousand dollar vehicle something like that uh not very much and it lasted us a few years um, when I was a kid, you know, my first vehicle was a, was a punk and orange, um, Ford Pinto station wagon that didn't run. That was our family vehicle for a time and then broke down. And my dad decided he was going to give that to me for my 16th birthday to, as my ride, I just got to, uh, learn how to fix it. <laughs> if I learn how to fix it, it's mine, you know, fix it up. Um, probably more his dream than <laughs> definitely more his dream than mine but my mom kind of came to the rescue in that in that uh at that point and um said hey I i'm gonna buy him a vehicle that he can actually drive right now so she ended up getting me this little 1977 fiat um from from the uk it was a weird little vehicle but it was it was fun in high school anyway that's some, some of my auto history but i don't buy new vehicles and i don't think i ever will um even if i had money i don't think i'd buy a new vehicle because it's just i i don't feel it's it's worth what you get for it but i don't know i haven't entirely done the math but when i think about say five thousand dollars for the repair that I, i'm looking at um versus you know buying a new vehicle what's the actual value you're getting well if i was buying one of my used vehicles you know what i what i've oh, i also had that i also had that uh, kia sportage for a bit mahoney and i did our own finance stuff on that one too um <laughs> when i think about it I think my most reliable vehicles have been used vehicles in the range of like ten to fifteen thousand dollars, and they last, a, you know, at least a good five years of me beating the heck out of them, driving them long distances and in rough conditions. Um, so ten to fifteen thousand dollars, I can get something that I I can expect to add. 150 to 200,000 kilometers to, um, which I think is a better value than spending twice that much, three times that much on a new vehicle. Like say, say you bought a really modest new vehicle at $30,000 brand new, right? $30,000, you're expecting to get about 300,000 kilometers out of it, right? So what you're actually paying is $1 per 10 kilometers mathematically one dollar per 10 kilometers so the used car is at at 10 to fifteen thousand dollars if it gets you 150 to 200 thousand kilometers it's definitely a better deal than a new car but there must be buyers of new cars in order to get used cars <laughs> i don't know how to solve that problem but in any case say we're say we're looking at new car pricing and i'm gonna have to pay five thousand dollars which is gonna have to go on the credit card which is gonna be pretty much the end of my credit um which is scary because i've got other other challenges going on in my life you know but got to do what I got to do because I have to have wheels so say I pay the five thousand dollars right 
how at new car price, how much should I be expected to be able to drive that car before, you know, it, it has a major breakdown again, at least of those, at least of those parts, you know, but those are the key, like other than the engine <laughs> transmission and transfer case are pretty significant, I guess. So, um, I'm so not the mechanic, but I can do math. So if I'm paying, you know, new car price and applying that to my $5,000, that means I should expect to be able to drive for 50,000 kilometers, at least before I experience another big breakdown. And I bet, I bet I get almost twice that much. Jared does his job and I know he, I, I trust he will. Because for sure and certain, the Jeep, the Jeep guys did not. <laughs> um, so yeah, if I get 50,000 kilometers, which I'm sure I will, and probably more than that, the value is the same value as buying a brand new car. So why not? That's what I got to do. That's the way I'm looking at it. It's the bright side. It's the glass half full, and I'm cool with that. Let's wrap this up, hey? Eh? I really didn't mean this to be another crisis entry in my journal. <laughs> Just taking a walk. Um, no, that's about it for, for the hardships and stuff. Uh, as far as other things this week that have gone on that it would be of any interest, I think. Um, what there hasn't been much for rattlesnakes. I think I, I got one call to Diamond City, so it was kind of an unpaid call out there just for the heck of of uh, helping the snake, um, getting it off of a an acreage out that way, and that was it. I don't I don't think I had any other snake calls since my last video update. <clears throat> so things have been slow. Uh, the reason for that is that. So the snakes are, are moving back to the, uh, oh, I did have another snake call, but it involved a dead snake on the road. Um, a lot of the snakes are moving back to the dens, right? It's that time of year. So my snake calls are going to dwindle here. My skunk calls are already dwindling. Um, there have been several mornings now that I haven't had any calls. So the wildlife work is dying out. The uh, the office work is hopefully picking up, <laughs> but in jeopardy at the moment. And um, that's about it for what's going on in the life of Rye for this week. Or what's gone on. Oh, here comes one of the marathoners. He's kind of walking at the moment. I'm going to leave you with, um, I think, some scenes from... William. William is the third, well, it's the oldest, oldest, uh, Chelsea's oldest son and the oldest child. And he had his seventh birthday, uh, last night at Indian Battle Park down the river bottom in Lethbridge. And, um, so I'll leave you with some scenes from his birthday pinata. <laughs> 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 no, it's his turn. Yeah. No, he's still he's young. Okay. 